Before today's video, we want to bring you a word from AppZone, who is a regular sponsor of this channel. AppZone is an app that suggests games to play, and then you earn money for just trying the games. Then the longer you play, the more you'll earn. AppZone pays out instantly through retailers like Google Play, Xbox, Visa, Steam, Amazon, and more. Every week I seem to find a new game which is a lot of fun to play, and I'm getting paid out in Amazon gift cards. If you download AppZone by clicking on the link below the video, you'll be directly supporting Criminally Listed. So help us keep the lights on and start earning money for yourself for playing games by downloading AppZone today. Without any further delay, here's today's video. Number 3. Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kylenborg In the video, Three Unsolved Mysteries with Mysterious Letters, Part 3, we cover the murders of 20-year-old Jay Cook and 18-year-old Tanya Van Kylenborg, who lived in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. The young couple had started dating in March 1987, and six months later, they decided to go on their first overnight trip. On November 18, 1987, they borrowed Cook's father's van and planned to drive to Seattle, Washington to do some camping and then drive back home the next day. The next evening, the couple still hadn't returned home, so their families contacted the police. The police were able to confirm that the couple had taken two ferries and made it to Seattle, but what happened to them after they got off the ferry was a mystery. Six days after they left on their trip, Van Kylenborg's half-naked body was found in a ditch near Alger, Washington, which is about 76 miles away from where they got off the ferry in Seattle. Her hands were bound with a zip tie, she had been sexually assaulted, and then she was shot to death. The next day, her wallet, some surgical gloves, more zip ties, a half-full box of ammunition, and the keys to the van were found in Bellingham, Washington, which is about 14 miles away from where her body was found. Later that same day, the van was found parked two blocks away from the items. The next day, Cook's body was found in Monroe, which is between Seattle and Alger. He had been beaten and strangled to death. The police theorized that the couple either met the killer on one of their ferry trips, or they picked him up as he was hitchhiking. Cook was killed first, and then the killer in Van Kylenborg drove to Alger. Then a week after the bodies were found, the parents of both Cook and Van Kylenborg received an unsettling letter. The author claimed that he was the killer, and he killed the couple because he hated Canadians. Then once every month for the next year, the parents would receive a disturbing letter, or for holidays like Father's Day and Mother's Day, they would get Hallmark greeting cards from the person who claimed to be the killer. In the letters and the cards, the author would taunt and mock the parents. The killer's DNA was found in the van, and a profile was developed. In 2010, the DNA found in the van was compared to the DNA found on the letters, and it wasn't a match. The police were able to track down the letter writer, thanks to tips from people who recognized the handwriting. It turned out that a mentally ill Canadian man who was homeless wrote the letters during a low point in his life. He was not involved in the murders, and he did not know who committed them. The man, who was 73 years old, was not charged with anything. In April 2018, the police had this computer-generated image developed based on markers found in the killer's DNA. Then the same company that developed the image entered the killer's DNA into a family genealogy database. When they did, they found the killer's second cousins. Then they started filling out the family trees of the second cousins. Eventually, they got to the point where the family trees crossed through a marriage, and that marriage produced one son. That son is William Earl Talbot II, who lived in Seattle and drove trucks for about 30 years. He was 24 years old at the time of the murders. The police had a list of 300 suspects, and Talbot's name wasn't on it. The police had no idea who Talbot was until the DNA company found him through reverse genealogy. The police followed Talbot for several weeks, and then they saw him throw out a coffee cup that had his DNA on it. 
They picked up the coffee cup and got a sample of Talbot's DNA. It was compared to the DNA that was found in the van and it was a match. Talbot was arrested on May 17, 2018, over 30 years after the murders. Number 2. Ashley Freeman and Laura Bible In our 10th video, which was posted in November 2016, we detail the horrifying disappearance of Ashley Freeman and Laura Bible. On December 29, 1999, Ashley Freeman, who lived in Craig County, Oklahoma, turned 16 years old. To celebrate her birthday, her best friend, 16-year-old Laura Bible, came over to sleep at the mobile home that Ashley shared with her parents. At 5.30 a.m., the fire department was called to the mobile home. When the fire department arrived at the mobile home, they found it completely engulfed in flames. The fire department put out the fire, and among the ruins, they found the body of Ashley's mother, 37-year-old Kathy Freeman. She had been shot in the back of the head with a shotgun. The fire department searched the wreckage, but they didn't find the bodies of the 16-year-olds or the body of Ashley's 40-year-old father, Danny Freeman. At first, the police thought that Danny may have killed Kathy, torched the trailer, and then fled with the two girls. But then the day after the fire, Laura's parents were looking through the wreckage and they found some human remains. It was determined that the remains were Danny Freeman. Like his wife, he had been shot to death with a shotgun. The area around the trailer was searched, but no trace of the girls was found. Over the years, the case grew cold. In spring 2002, serial killer Tommy Lynn Sells confessed to the crime. When he confessed, Sells was sitting on death row in Texas for a murder that he committed two days before Kathy and Danny were killed and the girls went missing. Sells broke into a trailer home in Del Rio, Texas, and he stabbed 13-year-old Kayleen Harris to death and slit the throat of her friend who was sleeping over, 10-year-old Crystal Searles. Crystal survived the attack, and she picked Sells out of a photo lineup. Sells was arrested a short time later. He was convicted, and in November 2000, he was sentenced to death. Between 1980 and his arrest in early 2000, Sells was a drifter, and it's thought that he murdered over 22 men, women, and children. He would break into people's homes, where he would be invited in, and then he would kill every member of the family. Other times, like he did with Kayleen, he just killed the children in their beds, and left their bodies for their parents to find in the morning. Sells later recanted his confession about killing the Freemans and kidnapping Ashley and Laura. He was executed in 2014 for the murder of Kayleen Harris. Another suspect in the double homicide and kidnapping was serial killer Jeremy Jones. Jones was arrested on September 19, 2004, two days after he sexually assaulted and shot to death 45-year-old Lisa Nichols in Turnersville, Georgia. After shooting Nichols three times in the head, he set her body on fire. Jones was arrested after he used Nichols' cell phone to call his girlfriend. In police custody, Jones admitted that, while he was high on methamphetamine, he killed Lisa Nichols. Jones then said that Nichols wasn't his only victim. In a rambling confession, Jones claimed to have killed 21 people in six states. This included the Freemans and Laura Bible. He said that he killed the parents over a drug debt. He then took the girls to an abandoned mine in Kansas where he shot them to death. The police searched the area where he said the girls' bodies were located, but they didn't find any trace of the girls. Jones later recanted his confession. Jones was convicted of the murder of Lisa Nichols, and he was sentenced to death. It's believed that he killed at least four other people. For over a decade, no other promising suspects emerged, and no evidence was found that could link either Sells or Jones to the crime. No trace of the girls was found either. Then in February 2017, 
cold case investigators found a box of documents pertaining to the case. The documents led to two private investigators who worked on the case. One of the private investigators gave the cold case investigators a piece of evidence they found at the crime scene. It was an insurance card for a vehicle. The police interviewed the owner of the card and she told them something that she had been keeping for a secret for a long time. She said she was sure that her former boyfriend, Warren Welch, was involved in the murders of the Freemans and the kidnapping of the two girls. She said she was sure because when Welch was in prison on drug charges, she found a briefcase in his trailer that contained some disturbing Polaroid photographs. In the pictures were two teenage girls. In some of the pictures, the girls were duct taped to chairs. In another, the girls are lying on a bed facing each other. There was another Polaroid of the girls on the bed and Welch was laying with them. The woman hid the Polaroids and when Welch got out of prison, he was angry to discover that the Polaroids weren't in the place where he left them. He called the woman and demanded to know what she did with them. She told him where they were and then he threatened her. He told her that if she told anyone about the Polaroids, he would kill her and dump her body in a pit, just like the girls in the pictures. Before Welsh went to prison, the woman said that he hung up the girls' missing posters on a wall in his trailer. The cold case investigators interviewed other people who knew Welch, and several other people saw the Polaroids as well. The witnesses were able to help the police piece together what happened on the night that the girls went missing. Warren Welch was a meth cooker and he worked with a dealer named David Pennington. On the night of the fire, Welch, Pennington and a third man named Ronnie Busick went to the Freeman's trailer to sell the score after a bad drug deal. They killed Kathy and David and then decided to take the girls for some quote unquote fun. The girls were kept alive for a few days in Welch's trailer. Then the girls tried to run away and they were strangled to death. Their bodies were then supposedly dumped in a pit in Pitcher, Oklahoma, not far from Welch's trailer. The collection of Polaroids has never been found. The three men would show the Polaroids to people to threaten them and to brag. Supposedly, over a dozen people knew about the Polaroids but said nothing. Welch died in 2007 and Pennington died in 2015, but Ronnie Busick is still alive. He was arrested in April 2018, nearly 18 and a half years after the crime. The families are now just hoping that the remains of Ashley and Laura will be found soon. Number 1. The Golden State Killer In our fourth ever video, we cover the case of the original Night Stalker. The killer is now commonly known as the Golden State Killer, which is a name that was coined by true crime writer, Michelle McNamara. McNamara, who was the wife of comedian Patton Oswald, was writing a book about the Golden State Killer when she passed away in 2016 because of an undiagnosed heart condition. It was originally thought that the Golden State Killer committed his first murder on December 30th, 1979 in Goleta, California. The wives of 44-year-old Dr. Robert Offerman and his 35-year-old girlfriend, Dr. Deborah Manning, were found in Offerman's condominium. Manning was lying face down on the bed. Her wrists were bound with twine and she had been shot once in the back of the head. Offerman was on his knees at the foot of the bed. He had been shot three times in the back. He had twine tied around one of his wrists. It's believed that the killer forced Manning to tie up Offerman, but she didn't tie him up tightly. Offerman was able to free himself, and he tried to fight off the attacker. Sadly, he ultimately failed. One thing that the police noted was that the knot used to tie up Manning was an unusual knot called a diamond knot. On March 16, 1980, three and a half months after Offerman and Manning were killed, there was another deadly home invasion. This time it was in Ventura, California, 
which is about 35 miles away from Goleta. Lyman Smith was 43 years old and he was a respected attorney. He was looking forward to being appointed a Superior Court Judge by the end of the month. Lyman lived with his second wife, Charlene, and she was 33 years old. On the afternoon of March 16th, Lyman's 12-year-old son from his first marriage rode his bike to his father's home. The front door was unlocked, and when he stepped into the house, he heard an alarm clock going off in the master bedroom. He made his way to the bedroom, and he saw something that he will never forget. His father and stepmother had been brutally murdered. The medical examiner determined that they had been beaten to death with a log from the fireplace. They both had been tied up with a drapery cord. Again, the cord had been tied with a diamond knot. Before she died, Charlene had been sexually assaulted. Six months later, Roger Harrington went to the home where his son, 24-year-old Keith Harrington, lived with his new wife, 27-year-old Patrice Harrington, in a gated community called Dana Point. Keith was in his third year of medical school, and Patrice was a nurse. When Roger entered the home, he noticed that it was unusually quiet. He went into his son and daughter-in-law's bedroom and found them lying face down in their bed that was drenched in blood. There were ligature marks around their wrists, but whatever was used to tie them up wasn't found at the crime scene. Patrice had been sexually assaulted, and then the couple was bludgeoned to death with a sprinkler head that the killer found in the backyard. Like the ligatures, the sprinkler head wasn't found at the crime scene. Another five months went by, and then on February 5th, 1981, the father of 28-year-old Manuela Wynne Hutton received a call from the bank where she worked. She didn't show up for work, and they couldn't get a hold of her. They also couldn't get a hold of her husband because he was in the hospital with a gastrovirus. Her father went to their middle class home in Irvine, California, and he found his daughter's dead body in her bed. There were signs that she had been tied up and sexually assaulted. She was beaten to death, most likely with a lamp that was missing from the house. Once again, five months went by, and then the police were called to a home in Goleta about a half a mile away from where Robert Offerman and Deborah Manning were killed. 35-year-old Sherry Domingo was house-sitting for a relative and her boyfriend, 27-year-old Gregory Sanchez, had spent the night. Once again, there were marks on their wrists that indicated that the couple had been tied up, but the ligatures were missing. The couple was beat to death. The murder weapon was missing but it's thought that the killer used a crowbar that he found in a tool shed. On May 4th, 1989, about five years after the last couple was killed, 18-year-old Janelle Cruz was at home alone in her family's home in Irvine, California. Her family was away on vacation, and Cruz didn't go with them because she couldn't get time away from her job at a local pizzeria. That night, she had a friend over, and they heard a noise in the backyard. They looked out the window and saw nothing. They just assumed that the noise was an animal. A short time later, they heard a noise in the garage, but Cruz thought it was just the washing machine. At about 10.45 p.m., the friend left and Cruz was home alone. The next day, a realtor who was showing the Cruz's home discovered her body. The murder weapon was missing but it was thought to be a pipe wrench that the killer found in the backyard. After Cruz's murder, the killings came to an end. Since the 10 murders took place over a distance of 200 miles, it took the police a long time to piece together that one person was responsible for all 10 murders. However, eventually the investigators couldn't ignore the similarities between the crimes. The killer seemed to target couples who lived in middle to upper class homes. Most of the victims were tied up and then killed with a weapon that the killer found in or around the home. He entered his victims' homes through unlocked doors or by prying open a sliding patio door. They called the killer the original Night Stalker. 
By the late 1990s, the original Night Stalker had not been identified, but some progress had been made on the case. Several investigators were confident that the murders weren't the only series of crimes that the killer committed. They also thought he was responsible for a series of 45 sexual assaults in the area east of Sacramento, California. The attack started in March 1976, and they came to an end around the time that the original Night Stalker murders began. The murders and the sexual assaults shared several commonalities. Notably, many of the sexual assault victims have been tied up using a diamond knot. The rapists also attacked people, quite often couples, in their home. He would tie up both the man and the woman, and then sexually assault the woman while the man watched. In some cases, he would step up the psychological torture. For example, after he tied up the male partner, he would balance a stack of dishes on him. He would tell the man that if the stack of dishes fell, he would kill them both. He was then forced to watch as the attacker sexually assaulted his partner. That criminal was known as the East Area Rapist. Besides the 45 sexual assaults, it's believed that the East Area Rapist also committed a double homicide. On February 2, 1978, 21-year-old Brian Majori and his 20-year-old wife, Katie Majori, were walking their dog near their home in Rancho Cordoba, California. As they walked, they were confronted by a man holding a gun and wearing a ski mask. The masked man led them into the backyard of one of their neighbors. Once they were in the backyard, the couple tried to run away, and they were both shot to death. Brian was shot in the chest, and Katie was shot in the head. In 2001, the DNA from the East Area Rapist and the original Night Stalker were compared, and they were a match. Unfortunately, the DNA didn't match anyone in the database. For years, the police, the FBI, reporters, and true crime writers investigated the Golden State Killer. Sketches of the killer were released to the public, as were a letter he supposedly sent, and pages from a notebook that was found near one of the crime scenes. They also released recordings of phone calls he may have placed. An example is this recording from 1977 that was left on a woman's answering machine. Unfortunately, despite the amount of information that was made public, it didn't lead to an arrest. Then, an investigator with Contra Costa County named Paul Holes entered the Golden State Killer's DNA into a consumer DNA database called GEDmatch. He found about 20 distant relatives of the Golden State Killer. He was able to trace their families back to a common ancestor, which was a set of great-great-great-grandparents who lived in the 1800s. From those common ancestors, Holes and his team started to fill out 25 family trees looking for a man who was about the same age as the Golden State Killer. This eventually led to 72-year-old Joseph James D'Angelo, who lived in Citrus Heights, a Sacramento suburb. Holes thought that D'Angelo was an interesting suspect. It turned out that D'Angelo was a former police officer. From 1976 to 1979, when the East Area Rapist was active, he was a police officer on the Auburn, California Police Force. He was fired from the police force in 1979 after he was caught shoplifting some dog repellent and a hammer. Also, on his record, it showed that he purchased two guns. He bought each gun shortly before the Golden State Killer used a gun in his murders. The police followed D'Angelo, and one day he drove to a Hobby Lobby. When he went into the store, the police took a sample of his DNA from the door handle of his car. Another sample was taken from a garbage can lid that he left outside of his home. 
both samples were a match to the Golden State Killer. On April 27, 2018, D'Angelo was arrested and he was charged with eight counts of murder and it's expected that more charges are still to come. Besides connecting him to the 45 sexual assaults and the 12 murders, D'Angelo was also linked to another string of crimes and a 13th murder. Between March 1974 and late 1975, before the sexual assault started, it's suspected that D'Angelo broke into over 100 homes in Visalia, California. He would trash the house and then only take small items. Before D'Angelo was identified as the suspect, the perpetrator was called the Visalia Ransacker. On September 11, 1975, near the end of D'Angelo's reign of terror as the Ransacker, 45-year-old Claude Snelling, who was a professor of journalism, was awoken by a noise in his home in Visalia. He went to his carport and saw a man in a ski mask trying to kidnap his daughter. The masked man shot Snelling twice and ran away. Snelling later died from his wounds. What is known about D'Angelo is that he served in the Navy during the Vietnam War. In 1973, when he was 27, he married a 20-year-old woman who went on to become a lawyer. They had three daughters together, but they ultimately divorced. In 1973, D'Angelo was hired to be a police officer in Exeter, California. He worked there until 1976, and then he joined the police force in Auburn. He was then fired for shoplifting in 1979. Around the same time that he was fired, the original Night Stalker murders began. In 1992, he got a job at a grocery distribution center in Roseville, which is a Sacramento suburb. He retired from the distribution center in 2017 after working there for 27 years. It's unknown where or if he worked between 1979 in 1992. When D'Angelo was arrested, the 72-year-old was living with his daughter and granddaughter. D'Angelo was never considered a suspect and he was only found because of the hard work of Paul Holes and his team. The families of the victims are thankful that the Golden State Killer was finally arrested. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please subscribe for more videos just like it. Don't forget to go to criminallylisted.com where you can buy merchandise, suggest cases, and find out about an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.